This topic, finding God without faith, is very personal for me. I was raised in a Roman Catholic family, and I went to Mass every Sunday. As a child, I attended a Catholic grade school where we were taught by nuns dressed in flowing black habits. Inside the towering church, during Mass, I was fascinated by the ornate altar where priests conducted a mysterious ritual that transformed ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The notes of the church organ vibrated deep inside me, and the melancholy chanting of Latin prayers sometimes moved me to tears. As a child, I was quite devout. I even fantasized about growing up to become a priest. But before long, I felt deeply troubled about my faith. Our school curriculum included a daily religion class in which we had to memorize and recite the official catechism of the church. We used a small book like this one, and it began, Who made us? God made us. Who is God? God is the supreme being, infinitely perfect, who made all things and keeps them in existence. Why did God make us? God made us to show his goodness and to make us happy with him in heaven. How can we gain the happiness of heaven? To gain the happiness of heaven, we must know God, we must love God, and we must serve God. Several times, I raised my hand in class to ask questions, like, would my Protestant and Jewish friends also be able to go to heaven? The nun scowled at me and said, I shouldn't ask such questions because these teachings simply have to be believed. They have to be completely accepted without doubt. I wondered back then, why did God give us powerful intellects if we were not supposed to use those intellects in religion class? Well, being scolded by the nun was the beginning of the end for me. Even as a child, I disliked the dogmatism of the church, even though I didn't know then what the word dogmatism meant. I quickly became disenchanted with the church, and by the time I was a teenager, I had developed an allergy to religion, so to speak. Later, when I was still in my 20s, I felt something missing in my life and that led me to undertake a spiritual quest. I started by reading books on Western philosophy, but I soon shifted to what we called Eastern philosophy, Taoism, Buddhism, and of course, Hinduism. I was really impressed by the works of Swami Vivekananda, the brilliant disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. That's how I got introduced to Advaita Vedanta. I started to attend classes taught by monks from the Ramakrishna mission. Then, in 1981, I happened to attend a lecture by Swami Dayananda, a lecture that affected me very deeply. Swami Dayananda said, God is not a matter of belief. God is a reality to be known, a truth to be discovered. Hearing those words transformed my thinking. And as you might already know, Swami Dayananda would soon become my guru. Instead of using the word God, Swami Dayananda generally used the Sanskrit word Ishvara. I later learned that he did this to avoid the enormous confusion 
associated with the word God. Most people agree that the word God refers to the one supreme being who created the universe. Yet for Christians, God exists as three divine persons. God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within. Three persons that are said to be one in essence. For Jews, on the other hand, God is Yahweh, the historical God of Abraham, who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and delivered the Israelites from slavery. But Muslims declare there is no God other than Allah, the All-Merciful and All-Powerful, whose prophet is Muhammad. Unlike the followers of those three Western religions, most Buddhists and Jains deny the existence of an almighty supreme being who created the universe. And for Hindus, well, it's a whole lot more complicated. The Hindu tradition accepts many individual gods and goddesses, yet all of them are considered to be forms of Ishvara. In the Rig Veda, the most ancient Hindu scripture, there's a famous but often mistranslated verse that says, Ekam sat viprabahu dhavadanti. Ishvara is one, who the wise describe in many ways. Even though Ishvara is one, Hindu scriptures describe Ishvara very differently than the one supreme being worshipped by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. You might be surprised to know that a remarkably precise definition of Ishvara can be found in many Vedantic works. This definition is incredibly helpful because so much confusion arises when we use words like God or soul or divinity without clearly defining what those terms mean. So a clear, precise definition of Ishvara is crucial. And that's what we'll discuss next. Before we continue, please note that Ishvara is not a hymn like God the Father or like Yahweh of the Jews. But grammatically, the Sanskrit word Ishvara happens to be masculine in gender. For this reason, masculine pronouns are used when referring to Ishvara. The precise definition I mentioned before is this. Abhinna Nimitta Upadana Karana, the efficient and material cause for the universe that is non separate from it. This definition might be precise, but it's much too terse and scholarly to be understood without some help. Let's try to unpack those words. First of all, Material cause and efficient cause are philosophical terms used to describe the two main factors necessary for any act of creation. To make a pot like this, the material cause is clay. That simply means clay is the material needed to make this pot. But in addition to clay, a pot maker is also required. The potter is the efficient cause, the maker, the intelligent agent needed to make a pot. To make a table like this, wood is the material cause, and a carpenter is the efficient cause. Obviously, nothing can be created without a suitable material or without a skillful maker. 
Now look at this. Potter and clay are two separate factors needed to make a pot. Carpenter and wood are two separate factors needed to make a table. In both cases, the two factors, the maker and the material, are different from each other. But the definition of Ishvara we're discussing describes him as being both the maker and the material, both the efficient and the material cause for the universe. To make a pot, a potter can dig clay from the ground. But to create the universe, Ishvara can't go to some kind of celestial storehouse for raw materials. Before the universe was created, Ishvara alone existed, nothing else. There was no external source of material. Logically speaking, Ishvara himself has to be the material cause for the universe as well as its efficient cause. How can that be? It's explained by a famous metaphor found in the Mundaka Upanishad, a Vedic scripture that says the universe is like a spider's web. Yatha urna na bihi srijate grinate cha. The universe is like a web that's spun by a spider and later gets consumed by the spider. That's an absolutely brilliant metaphor. Obviously, the spider is the efficient cause, the maker of the web. In spite of its extremely tiny brain, the spider has all the knowledge and power it needs to make a web. In the same way, Ishvara is said to possess all the knowledge and power needed to create the universe. That means Ishvara possesses infinite knowledge and limitless power. With that knowledge and power, Ishvara can create an incredibly complex universe, a universe that functions in a perfectly orderly manner. Ishvara's intelligent order ensures that planets continue to orbit their suns and electrons continue to orbit their nuclei. Ishvara's intelligent order also ensures that you receive the results of deeds you've committed in this life and in past lives. Now, let's return to the spider metaphor. For a web, the spider is not only the efficient cause, the maker, but it's the material cause as well. The spider weaves a web from silky threads produced by its own body. A potter needs clay, but a spider already has the necessary material within itself. In a similar way, Ishvara himself is said to be the source of the fundamental stuff out of which the universe is woven. Ishvara manifests the universe from himself without needing any kind of external material. In this way, Ishvara is both maker and material. Also, when a web gets damaged, the spider who made it will eat the threads and recycle the material to use in making another web. That nicely represents how Ishvara is said to withdraw the universe into himself at the end of a cycle of creation, before making the universe manifest once again in the next cycle. Okay, the spider metaphor is really helpful, but we're not done yet. Our definition of Ishvara describes him as being abhinna, non-separate. That is, non-separate from his creation, from the universe. A spider is obviously separate from its web. A spider can even abandon its web. 
But Ishvara can never abandon the universe. Why? Because according to the definition, Ishvara is utterly non-separate from the universe, as we'll discuss in just a moment. The spider metaphor is not perfect. As you know, all metaphors have limitations. Metaphors are tools we use to understand things. After hammering in a nail, if you need to tighten a screw, you'll grab a screwdriver. In the same way, after using the spider metaphor, we can use another one, a metaphor found in the scriptures that compares the universe to the dream world that you create each night while you sleep. When you sleep, a dream world arises in your mind, a world filled with people, clouds, trees, animals, and so on. Then, when you wake up, that dream world fades away. It returns to its source. It returns to you, its creator. For that dream world, you are its creator, its sustainer, and its destroyer, just like Ishvara in the form of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva is said to be the creator, sustainer, and destroyer of the universe. More than that, to create a dream world, you are both the maker and the material, the efficient and the material cause. As the efficient cause, you possess all the knowledge and power needed to create the dream world. It's created from your memories and imagination. And further, it is you who determines the laws of nature that govern your dream world. You are the source of its intelligent order. That's why you can fly in your dreams and fall great distances without getting hurt. In the same way, Ishvara is said to determine the laws that govern this universe. Ishvara himself is the source of the intelligent order that regulates the world. For your dream world, not only are you its maker, the efficient cause, but you are its material cause as well. The trees and houses in your dreams are not made of wood, nor are the people in your dreams made of flesh and bones. What are they made of? They're made of you, of your own mind stuff, so to speak. In the same way, everything in the universe is said to be a manifestation of Ishvara. The universe is therefore made of Ishvara. The Chandogya Upanishad says quite boldly, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this, the entire cosmos, is nothing but Brahman, nothing but Ishvara. My own guru often reiterated this teaching. He said, the truth is not that there is one God, but rather that there is only God. <laughs> wow, what an amazing teaching. Okay, we've just finished describing Ishvara with the help of a precise scholarly definition. We also used a series of metaphors to better understand the source and creator of the universe. In that whole discussion, what were you asked to believe? Nothing. Nothing at all. That's what I find so remarkable about Advaita Vedanta. Its teachings make extensive use of reason to present Ishvara as a reality to be understood, a truth to be discovered, a supreme being who can actually be known and not remain merely as a matter of belief.
Now, in the final part of this presentation, let's consider some possible shortcomings in Vedanta's highly rational approach to Ishvara that rejects belief. When you think about it, Vedanta's logic and reason don't seem very helpful if you want to cultivate intense emotions of love and reverence for Ishvara. The precise definition we've discussed doesn't seem to directly lead to a practice of heartfelt prayer, veneration, and worship. After all, no one prays to a material and efficient cause. We pray to an all-powerful and all-knowing Supreme Being. Most Hindu traditions that emphasize devotion, bhakti, are not based on scholarly Vedantic teachings. Instead, they're based on devotional teachings associated with mythological stories, stories about forms of Ishvara like Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu, and Ganesha. Most of those stories are found in the Puranas, where gods and goddesses are elaborately portrayed together with their divine attributes, their supernatural deeds, and their extraordinary blessings bestowed on sincere devotees. Those Puranic stories can certainly inspire intense devotional feelings, especially in Hindus who grew up listening to such stories. But for many, including spiritual seekers like me who were not raised in Hindu families, those stories often fail to provide a strong foundation for devotional practices. So we can ask, is it possible to develop intense feelings of devotion to Ishvara without believing in those stories of gods and goddesses? Is it possible to develop devotion through spiritual knowledge alone? Absolutely. In the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere, knowledge of Ishvara is extolled as a powerful means for cultivating devotion. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says quite plainly, The wise realize my divine nature and worship me with devoted hearts. After gaining knowledge of me as the imperishable source of all beings, but how can mere knowledge of Ishvara possibly lead to intense emotions of love and reverence? Well, consider this. In India, many couples are wedded as a result of arranged marriages. For this reason, it's not unusual for newly married couples to hardly know each other. But over a period of time, they come to know each other better and better. And as that knowledge grows deeper, their feelings of love and intimacy also grow deeper. This example suggests that as your knowledge of Ishvara grows deeper and deeper, you can indeed cultivate intense emotions of love and reverence. That was certainly my experience. As a young man who was allergic to religion, I wasn't inclined to believe anything whatsoever. Not surprisingly, when I began to study Advaita Vedanta, the mythological stories in the Puranas didn't attract me at all. Back then, I admitted to a fellow student, I don't have a devotional bone in my body. Yet, over a period of years, I gradually developed a rich and meaningful prayer life. For decades now, most of my mornings begin with prayer, puja, and meditation on Ishvara. But how could heartfelt bhakti like that take root in a hyper-rational non-believer like me? Well, studying Sri Krishna's teachings in the Bhagavad Gita has probably helped me more than anything else. 
other Vedantic teachings have also helped a lot, like the dream metaphor we discussed before. With the help of all those teachings, I've gradually come to feel that the world around me is truly a divine manifestation of Ishvara. Everything I see, hear, taste, smell, and touch seems to be endowed with divinity. When I go for a walk on the beautiful trails behind our ashram, I feel like I'm walking through Ishvara, as if I'm surrounded by Ishvara, or embraced by him, so to speak. My own body and mind also seem like divine manifestations of Ishvara. With age, they take on a unique kind of beauty, like a favorite old book that you still treasure in spite of all its loose pages and its broken binding. When I teach a class or work on producing a video like this one, I feel so grateful for the skills and intelligence that Ishvara has given me. When I start a new project, I know that the outcome of my efforts will be determined by Ishvara, according to his intelligent order that governs the universe. During morning puja, the deities on my little altar connect me to a divinity that's immeasurably vast and infinitely powerful. And when I close my eyes for prayer or meditation, I can sense that beyond the manifestation of Ishra that surrounds me and sustains me, there is an even greater reality a reality that transcends the universe, like a dreamer transcends his dream world. Now, I have to admit that I don't always feel such a profound sense of being intimately connected to Ishvara. Each day, there are many times when I get distracted or absorbed in mundane matters, and I temporarily lose that sense of Ishvara's divine presence. After all, I'm a normal human being, not a great saint. But that profound sense of intimacy is always accessible. It's always available. It only takes a moment of prayerful reflection. Ishvara is never more than one thought away. I've just shared some very personal observations about myself. My intention here is not to demonstrate any kind of spiritual accomplishment, but rather to make a particular point. And the point is, if someone as unlikely as me can develop a rich and meaningful prayer life with the help of Vedanta's teachings, then anyone can. Such is the power of these teachings. <laughs>